Hello, and welcome to History Soundbites, a podcast in which historians present their current research and leave us all feeling smarter and more informed for their efforts. Today's podcast features Maya Rook, an adjunct instructor with Southern New Hampshire University. Her presentation, The Origins of the Witch Trials in Europe. Sit back and enjoy. So Maya, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, introduce yourself to the crowd, and uh, tell us what you're up to here? Uh, yes, yeah, so my name is Maya Rook, and uh, I live in Rochester, New York, and I've been teaching at SNHU online for about since September, I believe, so quite a few terms. I um, really enjoy teaching online. Um, my background is mostly in American history, but what I've done with this project is actually taken on looking at the European witch trials. So it's been really interesting kind of pushing my boundaries, my comfort zone. I'm working for an online database where we're trying to frame two different arguments about the witch trials to help teach students how you can approach a historical topic from two different, two different aspects. So I looked at all the different research that had been done on the European witch trials, trying to understand why they happened, why so many people were killed, particularly women. Um, it ended up taking a standpoint, on one hand, that people believed they were actually doing it because of religion, on the other hand, that it was because of issues around gender. Um, so that's the sort of overarching idea of the project. Yeah, those are interesting arguments and ones that come up a lot. Um, I've covered this topic extensively in the world history courses that I teach, and it's it's always a it's always an interesting conversation because some people come down on the side of religion, some come down on the side of gender. When in reality, it's probably a, a combination of multiple factors: um, economic, gender, religion. So I'm really interested in getting into this conversation. Before we jump into that, who are you partnering with on this database? Infobase Publishing, and the database is Facts on File. And what is the final format of that project going to look like? Is it going to be a book or like a, a, an online database? What kind of thing are you going to create here? Yeah, it's all online. So I basically provide the research and the writing. Um, they do the editing, and it's, it's presented. All of the different database entries are pretty much the same. You have like the issue, the different arguments, background information, chronology, we throw some what if questions in there. Um, so my question was like, what if women ran the trials? And then I also give suggestions for images and for maps and things like that. Then they put it all together and they post it through their database for students to access. Is this going to be something like the, I don't know if you've ever seen the slave trade database where they have entries for each individual shipment of slaves across the ocean? Is it going to be something like that where you've got individual cases, I suppose, of individual witches? Is that kind of the thing you're going for? Are you go or are you going for more of a comprehensive look at kind of just this is what the general trend was? For this case, it's much more of like a broad, comprehensive look at it. So it's mainly for high school and college students. And so the idea is like they can go on there and get a broad scope. Um, and then we provide primary sources for them so they can go into the details there. It would be really cool to have a database just devoted to the witch trials. <laughs> so you could look at the individual cases and different statistics and how research has changed over time. But for this particular one, it's just going to be more of that broad scope. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. I agree. It would be really cool to have a site that listed all of the different cases and the outcomes of the cases and who was accused, who were the accusers. I think that stuff would be really cool to have. That's probably overkill for, for what you're <laughs> trying to do with this project, so I get it. I was just going to mention, I know with the Salem Witch Trials in America that the University of Virginia did something like that where you could actually go and look at all the different transcripts and read about the different individuals. Um, and even that is pretty massive and that was you know just for the smaller trials that happened in america pay attention historians and future historians because this sounds like it's going to be a great starting point for a potential uh public history or interactive project i think the history of magic and witchcraft is endlessly fascinating to me i actually when i was probably about 11 years old and goes fifth sixth grade I discovered all the books on witches and witchcraft and witch trials in the library and it was kind of like my first research project <laughs> that I conducted on my own so coming back to this as an adult uh, was really cool looking back at that history of magic the thing about magic is that humans have always for the most part engaged with it you can see magic across the globe in different spiritual and religious traditions and on different rungs of society 
So, you know, humans have a history of trying to manipulate the natural world or interact with it and interact with the supernatural world. Um, and it's only really in the European witch trials where you see this incredible number. It ranges from 50,000 to 100,000 is the current estimate of people who were actually executed as witches. So that's very unique to Europe. But magic is, in my opinion, more of a, a human experience. So when I was looking for the origins of magic and witchcraft, the European trials, I actually found research that set it as far back as having roots in ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, Rome. So in these different societies, people use things like incantations, salves, concoctions. They would make amulets, create divinations to do things like heal or protect, to dispel evil forces, um, and make predictions about the future. And of course, it varied from society to society. So Egyptians might be interested in magical practices and spells that might help an individual in the afterlife. And some of these societies also had differences between harmful magic or a healer or magician. So people who could either use it for malevolent causes or to do things like purification. Things like utilizing um, incantations to consult with the dead happened with the ancient Greeks. So we have all these different aspects that are kind of growing from these ancient societies and eventually going to impact the way that it's perceived in Europe during the trials. And one interesting thing that I found was most of these societies, magic was accepted as part of society. But in Rome, you actually start to see more of a prohibition of incantations for harmful purposes. People like Pliny the Elder thought that magic was a fraudulent art. So this is where we're seeing a lot of these early indications of some issues around magic and an association of women with magic who could use it to cause harm. That idea of women as witches isn't really going to be fully formed until about the 1500s in Europe. Before that, it's mostly associated with men, and they were seen as the ones who could have that particular power. And women were more likely to be using it in the sort of day-to-day -day life. So what begins to happen as we get towards the European witch trials is that Europe is becoming increasingly, increasingly Christianized and Christianity as it is going across Europe is combining with some of the pagan beliefs that existed throughout Northern and Western Europe. At first, they're kind of merging together. They might absorb them into new practices. They might suppress them. But for the most part, it's not as big of an issue. And it's around right before, say, the Reformation, sort of during the Inquisition eras, that magic becomes associated primarily with harm. And that's when it becomes a threat. So magic and sorcery, witchcraft, they had been a part of the European mindset, and then they become more of a concern. So we had people who were called cunning folk. And these were individuals, men and women, who usually were healers. Um, so they could use things like herbs and salves, doing things to just kind of ease the troubles of daily life. But because this idea of harm starts coming in to magic, it's seen that even people who are just practicing these simple magic practices are seen as causing harm as well. And it becomes connected with the devil. So rather than them just sort of working with the natural, supernatural world, Christianity began to believe that it's only through a pact with the devil that you could actually gain magical powers. And at this point, it becomes linked to heresy, so that if you're interacting, if you're doing any sort of magic, that you are committing heresy against the church. And so therefore, you know, th there needs to be some kind of punishment involved and to suppress that particular act. Is this around the time that some of the official uh, religious tomes regarding magic and how the church should deal with magic start to pop up? Yes. As these concerns grow, then we start to see texts being published that are linking harmful magic, a pact with the devil, and witchcraft into this idea of heresy against the church. And they begin to come out right before the printing press, actually. And then the major one that most people no, is the Malleus Maleficarum. And that one comes out pretty much right, you know, after the printing press has allowed for texts to be reprinted and spread on a larger scale. Um, and so that's sort of seen as the first major handbook on witchcraft. 
Right. So just to sum up where we are so far, basically we've got the idea that before the Christian era, so to speak, or at least the modern Christian era, before that point, magic was basically just seen as people interacting with the natural world and supernatural world for a variety of purposes. But over time, view of magic, people became a bit more, I don't know if you want to say scared of it or skeptical of it, but we got to the point where by the time we got to the Christian era, magic had been seen largely as a source of, I don't know, evil or trickery or deceit, something like that. Mm -hmm. And therefore, since that stuff comes from the devil, therefore witches must be in some sort of league with the devil, or not necessarily witches, but practicer, practices, practicers? Whatever word I'm looking for. Practitioners? <laughs> the, people who, the practitioners, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> the practitioners of witchcraft have to be, in order to do evil things with the witchcraft, they must be in league with the devil. And so when we get to the Christian era, basically we're getting to the point now where people want, to, from a religious perspective, are looking for ways to root out witchcraft because it is seen as a tool of the devil. What comes next? So, um, as I mentioned, Malice Maleficarum, one of these first handbooks on witches, this is when information on witches really begins to spread. Obviously, the printing press revolutionized the way that information was spread across Europe. And Malice Maleficarum is, it's known as sometimes called the Bible of witch hunters. Um, the actual translation is the Hammer of Witches. And it was published in 1486 in Germany. So this book essentially taught people how to identify witches, described how to find them, uh, described how to put them on trial, and what to do with them if they were found guilty. One of its central points is that witches actually exist, and that those who denied that witches were in existence were guilty of heresy as well. So... This idea that witches exist, that if you don't believe in them, that you are actually a heretic, you know, there's a lot of fear that is building there. And we can see the guy who wrote it, um, Heinrich Kramer, was you know, very, very, he had a lot of fear around witchcraft, which is, and he had, had this intense idea that we needed to exterminate anybody who practiced witchcraft. This book is also where we start to see the first indications on a large scale that more women than men were witches. And a large part of the book is setting up an argument for why women were more likely to be witches than men. And this is an important point because it directs attention to a lot of the social changes that are happening in Europe, especially regarding gender, the place of women, you know, the emphasis on fertility, both uh, agricultural and, and human. So um, I'm really interested in this part of the conversation. It's interesting that they're essentially making witches into part of scripture. If they're basically saying that witches exist, you have to believe that they exist or you are a heretic. Because I mean, it sounds like if you're really concerned that witchcraft is a bad thing and the spread of witchcraft is a bad thing, that your, your story or your, your line on that might be, oh, it doesn't really exist. Don't even bother trying it. it does, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's just something kids do. It's not something serious people do. But, if you're, but you're not going that route. You're going more the route that, no, it exists and you need to be scared of it. It's from a, from a modern, maybe a more cynical perspective. It makes it sound like this is kind of an effort at controlling people's thought, which I guess is the point if this is a religious text. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a very different tactic than you would expect people to take if they're really scared of, of witchcraft. But I suppose in an era where you don't have other explanations for why things happen, I suppose you do have to take it seriously. So it's, it's, it's a difficult concept to kind of wrap our modern minds around, I think. Yeah, I agree. I think it's hard in the present day to look back and say, did they believe they were acting rationally? They were looking for reasons to explain what was going on around them, and this was what they came up with. Now, the Malice Maleficarum is interesting because it is the most famous text um, that was written as a handbook on witchcraft, but you also have people who were looking at it and thought it was kind of ridiculous uh, what Kramer was actually saying in it. So in my research, one of the things that I found was, okay, I was like, okay, so how did he actually come to write this book? So he basically went to Pope Innocent the Seventh, and he had to just become Pope. And he said, in Germany, we have all these witches, and I want to be able to get rid of them. So he issued a bull giving him permission that he should rid Germany of witches. So Kramer goes back to his hometown and he begins to lead an inquisition against witches. And he's trying to conduct this inquisition primarily in Innsbruck, 
And this is in 1485, just to give you a sense of the timing. But he wasn't very welcomed in the area. He was actually known for an intense use of intimidation, torture. He would distort the facts, and he wouldn't allow people to have legal defense. So within a year, he was ordered to end the Inquisition and leave Innsbruck. And he was really angry about this. So what he ended up doing is he composed and he published the Malleus Maleficarum right afterwards. Um, He actually got it published within nine months. Uh, which at that time would have been pretty fast. And then I've also read some critiques of the book that say, like, there was no editor, there's repetitive information, he has, like, reference points that go nowhere. So even though it has been passed down over time and was used by a lot of people, there's a lot of issues within this particular text as well. And he did use a lot of scriptural evidence, but you did have people later on who were skeptical of the witch trials, who said, actually, the people who were doing all these inquisitions were the ones who were heretics, that there was no actual witches, um, that these were the people who were not living good Christian lives. So you do see both sides to that. Okay, that's good to know. Okay, well, you've given us a really good discussion so far of how the how the witchcraft developed and how the fear of witchcraft and the development of anti-witchcraft texts like the Malleus Maleficarum. Can you tell us a little bit about how these witchcraft trials actually worked? What was the process? Who was accused? Who were the accusers? Sure, sounds good. So I think the most important thing to keep in mind with the trials is that they took place over you know, a few hundred years, so they could vary a lot from place to place, and they were complex um, in how accusations were made and how they unfolded. There are general patterns, though, that we do see throughout Europe with the trials. So we can keep in mind that a lot of these trials were taking place within a patriarchal social structure. So in these situations, men were holding leadership positions in communities and families with the law, with religion, with culture. And in general, women were largely viewed as being subordinate to men. And women were more likely to be accused. Uh, It ended up being about 80 percent of those who were executed were women. So to get an idea of who these women were, in general, they tended to be older, unmarried, and widowed, and often did not have very much money. So in looking at it in the patriarchal social structure, these women are existing in their lives without a lot of male supervision. Um, they're existing on their own. They tended to have less power in terms of physical power, economic and political power, So I thought it was really interesting. One theory that I found from a scholar was that this lack of power in terms of the social and political spectrum may have contributed to ideas that women were more likely to use magic to fulfill their needs because they didn't have the same kind of power that a man might have. So if there was a dispute, a man might be able to take someone to court, but a woman, especially an older woman living on her own, she might just mutter an angry remark under her breath. So over time, that happens enough, strange things start happening, somebody's crop fails, or a cow dies, and they're looking to blame something for that. So they might look to these women within society that kind of exist more on the margins and aren't really, you know, a part of a family or as big of a part of a community. They don't have as much legal economic protection around them, so they're particularly vulnerable to that. And just so we don't want to, we want to make sure that we don't downplay the significance, but you know the death of a cow to somebody living in medieval Europe that is that is a big deal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it it does make sense that they would be looking for an explanation for that. And it's very easy to see how they could jump straight to um, malevolent, possibly culminating in violence against the person who did it because. Uh, these are very poor people looking back again from a modern perspective who cares about if, if a cow died but you know the cow may have been everything that that person owned and so if it died that can be a really big deal yeah that's a great point i think that really helps us get a little more into the mindset of how people viewed the world at this time today we live in a very like throwaway culture so we might not think about how important those things would have been to people yeah exactly So some of the crimes that witches might be accused of could range. So they might be accused of causing injury to somebody, to cause an illness, to cause the death of an individual or an animal, miscarriage, stillbirth. Um, Particularly if a woman was a midwife, they might be, if they're very involved in helping other women 
give birth and there was a miscarriage or stillbirth, they might be accused of causing that to happen. The failure of crops, cattle or other livestock, not giving milk or acting strangely. Um, and a lot of this comes around for infertility and fertility. So women in general, you know, often were responsible for children, for farm animals. They have the ability to create life and to heal and provide care. So now those women's domains are being seen. Anything that sort of negative can come out of that. So the power to give life is then seen as there's also the potential for the power to take away life. And fertility, again, was a big issue that came up during these trials, um, making women and men infertile, causing crops to fail and causing livestock also to be infertile as well. So that's sort of overview of general things that people might be accused of during the trials. Could you talk a little bit about the types of women that might have been accused of these these crimes? A lot of the reading that I did in the in the past on this topic actually suggests that a lot of these women were outsiders within the society. So they might have been widows. They might have been women that were never married. They tend to live on the outskirts of town. They tend to practice a lot of, I guess, what we would call, you know, herbal arts or something along those lines where they would be creating different types of salves or potions and things for the community. So just wondering if you've come across any of that and how we can how we start to see predominantly women and the types of women that are associated with witchcraft at this time? Yeah, the statistics I've seen do indicate that a lot of the women would have been unmarried uh, or widowed and kind of living on the margins of society. I've seen some different interpretations of the idea that a lot of these women were would have been using like herb salves or simple potions. And part of this is because at, during like the 80s and the 90s, there started to be a lot of people who claimed that like a million women were burned alive during the European witch trials and it's because they were actually pagans and they were practicing magic and a lot of that a lot of these women were living pretty simple lives so they may have herb gardens and like many people have been using them for simple cures but this idea that they were sort of like roots of paganism and the roots of what modern witchcraft is now I've seen to be largely discredited by scholars, and that's not to take away from the the pain that happened, but these statistics of like that it was a million people has been largely largely reduced. Many of these women that were accused and executed during the trials did tend to exist more on what would be seen as the margins of society, being unmarried, being widowed. Sometimes these women would be midwives, so they'd be helping other women to give birth, um, or caring for children, caring for crops. Particularly if women were unmarried or widowed, um, as I mentioned before, they wouldn't have any sort of legal or economic protection, um, and so tended to exist more on the margins of society. I did find that accusers often, they use similar terms to describe these suspected witches, so unpleasant, abrasive, self-centered, and quick to anger are some of the terms that come up to describe suspected witches. You know, you look at that, this is in the minds of the accusers. So being self-centered, well, maybe they just lived on their own and they had to be self-sustaining. Quick to anger, you know, maybe there's a reason why they lived on their their own and they, they wanted to kind of be on the margins of society and not be a part of the regular community life. And so you know, I think in any society we see that people who are on the margins, there tends to be a lot of suspicion around them. There can be difficult to understand and they can become scapegoats for these different crimes. It's also interesting because it reverts to gender types, right? So women that tradition, you know, at this time being seen as more emotional, less in control of their emotions. So very, you know, their emotions fluctuate at all times. Um, also needing a man in order to survive in the world. So we see a lot of connections there to how women were supposed to behave in this society as opposed to how these specific women were behaving. Yes, exactly. And we also see this idea, um, which is largely linked in the, the biblical evidence that supports the witch trials. People use the Bible to say that like, women were weaker than men. We can look back to the story of Adam and Eve for that um, as part of the root. Um, and that because of this sort of weakness, they're more likely to give in to temptation of the devil. One of the case studies that I included within uh, this particular 
project was in 1324 Ireland and of Alice Keitler. This is interesting. It comes before the peak of the trials. The peak really happens between about 1560 and 1630, but the trials do begin earlier. So this is um, on the early end of the spectrum in the 1300s. But this is one of the first trials that shows this link between magic and sorcery and heresy. It also treats the people who are accused as members of an organized group. So this idea of having a coven of witches, it's not just an individual, but they're all in cahoots together. And also that accused a woman of having sexual relations with a demon. Um, so this is one of the first trials that does that. So it's a good case study to see how these trials might unfold. So Alice, she lived in Ireland. She was actually from a Flemish family. She married several times. So she married and she had a son, and then her husband died. Then she remarries, that husband dies. She remarries for a third time, uh, that husband dies. She finally remarries uh, a fourth time, and that one, he survived. Um, so, but with each of her husband's death, Alice and her son, William, they would obtain more and more inheritance and property. So whereas some women who were accused in trials, they might not necessarily you know, be married or have property. In this case, Alice did have a good amount of power in having this inheritance money and having property. In 1324, Alice is accused with a group of five other women um, of practicing heretical sorcery. So seven charges are brought against them, um, and these included that they had a denial of their Christian faith, that they had sacrificed live animals to evil demons, that they concocted potions and powders to induce love spells and to cause physical harm to others. And then the final two accusations were specific to Alice. So one is that she used sorcery in the death of her first three husbands. And the final accusation was that she copulated with a demon um, who they called Son of Art. Uh, and this demon sometimes appeared in the form of a cat or a black dog. What's interesting about these accusations is it basically brings together what the stereotype of the witch was that emerged during this time. Coming together with other women, engaging in a witch's sabbat where you would do things like deny your Christian faith, you would make sacrifices, and you would copulate with the devil. And that was how one sort of formalized their pact. Uh, with the devil and formally became, became a witch. Alice was found guilty, but she actually managed to escape before her punishment. We also see in this trial the use of torture, which was very common during the witch trials. So Alice did escape, but one of her accomplices, who was seen as her accomplices, Petronila, she was interrogated. She received at least six floggings and other torture until she yielded a confession um, and basically admitted she confessed all the charges against her, and she admitted that Alice had also committed sorcery and used sorcery to commit these different acts. So this other woman then was uh, paraded through the town and burned alive publicly. Uh, so that was also something that was common during the trials. Typically, either people would be burned alive or they would be asphyxiated beforehand and then burned. Yeesh. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just reading an article the other day that was talking about um, that we tend to think that they were burned at the stake, but I think more of them were actually hanged than were than were burned. I mean, either way is not a good way to go. But yeah, right. that's uh, that's yeah. really awful. In in Europe, in continental Europe, uh, there was more likely to be burnings, and in in England, it was more likely to be hanging. So it kind of depended on the location. The <laughs> local culture has their own favorite ways of disposing of witches, I guess. So we've talked a bit about one of the trials, and we've talked a bit about the religious justifications for the tri that people had for the pursuing witchcraft and pursuing the trials and all of that. Are there any other theories that you have come up with for why these trials happened? You've kind of made the religious case already, but are there any other uh, justifications that you've come across? Yeah, the other major case I looked at was at gender, and that's sort of where I tend to lean personally, is that it had a lot to do with gender. Uh, so it was interesting taking on this project and having to you know, argue two different sides. And of course, as we learn, you know, going deeper and deeper into a topic, it's so nuanced that there's never one answer. But I do see a lot within the gender side of it. With the religious side, witches were seen as being an inver inversion of Christian beliefs and practices. 
on the gender side, it's more of that the images of the witches and the witchcraft trials are an inversion, but of ideas of late medieval and early modern femininity. And in this sense, when you look at what women were accused of, they're representing an aberration of prescribed notions of womanhood. Some scholars who have really gone on this end have said things like it wasn't about witch hunting, it was about woman hunting. Some of these key aspects of inversion would be witches attacks on fertility, both on the land and the people, rituals of infanticide that would occur at these witches sabbats that witches were supposedly going to and engaging in this unrestrained debauchery. And also this idea of women's sexuality that's culminating in copulation with the devil. So going back to the Malice Maleficarum, one of the most infamous lines in it is, all witchcraft comes from carnal lust, which is in women insatiable. That is a bold comment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all witchcraft. I think if there's one thing we could say about witch hunters, I think we could just all agree that they were pretty bold. <laughs> yes, exactly. So th these, um, these two theories, they're very nuanced, but when we come down to the, the overall umbrella over the topic, we're talking religion and gender. So we're seeing this occur throughout Europe, but we also see it transported overseas to the Americas, which isn't surprising because the colonists are coming from this background in Europe. You know, as we wrap up, can we talk a little bit about similarities or um, and differences between the witch hunts in Europe and those in America. Um, you know, I assume that we're still looking at some of the same concerns we're dealing with colonial times. We still have concerns over the fertility of both the land and uh, the people, but we also have very puritanical groups coming to the states, which are extremely religious and would continue these practices based on religious beliefs. So what are some of the, the connections that you've seen and some of the distinct characters between the the European and the American witch hunts? When I look at the Salem witch trials in America, you know, what I see there is just so much fear. And studying the Puritans, this idea of coming over and having this experiment, trying to found this society based on their beliefs. And within a couple generations, it's really falling apart in a lot of ways. So I see the Salem witch trials as a big example of people kind of just trying to hold on to something and it getting out of control. What I find interesting about the Salem trials, which differs from the European trials, is that the Salem witch trials are really instigated by children, that they're the ones who begin the accusations and then the adults kind of run with it. And I didn't really find any evidence of that when I was looking at the, the European trials. That actually reminds me of <clears throat> something that I talk about in when I'm lecturing on the Salem witchcraft trials. I'm not no expert on it by any means. But one of the things that I picked up at some point in grad school, I don't remember where I got the idea. I probably inherited it from another student who inherited it from someone else. But somewhere along the line, somebody mapped out Salem and they mapped out where did all of the defendants live and where did all the accusers live. And when you when you put it all on a map of the village of Salem, all of the defendants live along a new road that had just been constructed between Boston and I forget where 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 it goes up north, but it was along this this new road that connected basically connected Salem to the rest of Massachusetts and New England, and so there had been a whole lot of new traffic coming through that portion. It's kind of on the eastern edge of the village of Salem. And so there's all kinds of new traffic coming through, new vendors, new shipments of stuff. And so if you're looking at it purely from a geographical distribution, it makes it look, and, and by, by, so basically, I, let me back up, all of the accused live along that road, and all of the accusers live kind of on the west side of town, which is kind of like the backwoods area of town that's not engaged in this new trade that's going out to other areas of, of New England. And so what people are conjectured about that is that we're wondering if this part of this is also just a fear of modernity that you've got people in the backwoods who fear that they're being left behind and that their way of life you've, you've kind of touched on you know the way of life being affected and people are scared about changes to their way of life and everything but you've got backwoods folks that are scared of basically I don't know if you want to call it urbanization but at least people getting more involved in a wider broader regional trade possibly international trade depending on where the shipments are going and all that 
So it comes down to kind of an economic, in a way, an economic argument, but also a traditional argument. People in the backwoods scared of all this new stuff that's happening on the east side of town. And so when you start look, when you get scared, as we've mentioned here before, you start looking for justifications for why things are falling apart in your eyes. And so some, so the conjecture from a purely geographical distribution standpoint is that the accusers are accusing which people of witchcraft mainly as a, as kind of a proxy for waging war on modernity. And I have no citations to give you on that, <laughs> unfortunately. But it's kind of it, from a from a logical standpoint, it feels right. But I don't know. Have you ever seen anything like that, either re regarding Salem or even regarding anything in Europe? Yeah, I recall uh, also seeing a map like that for Salem. And uh, one thing that I seem to remember is that when people were accused and imprisoned and put on trial, that the town actually could take over their land and their property. So that was, I believe, another reason that was, uh, or argument that was given was that it was a way to kind of gain more control over the area. I think that idea of like fear of this change and fear of modernity coming in does make a lot of sense. You know, the Puritans, as I said, were, you know, they're trying to establish themselves in America and had a very specific vision of what they were doing, and it unravels fairly quickly. Yeah, this supports that idea because yeah, you definitely obviously in 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 um or definitely in Massachusetts where the Pilgrims landed, of course, you know, back in 1620s or whatever. Uh, yeah, they're in pretty firm control. But by the time the witchcraft trials are happening in the 1690s, over that 70 years, there's been the introduction of a whole lot of new people, a whole lot of new ideas. The Pilgrims have kind of lost their grip over society. There's a lot of other religions kind of coming in maybe not officially, but kind of sneaking in and all of that. So there, that, I think, I'm wondering, there's probably just, I mean, there's part of it is a fear of, back, a fear of backsliding, a fear of just losing control over your culture, the outsiders coming in, the immigrants coming in, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so it, it, and again, it, it feels right, but I, I don't have anything to really back yeah. that up. Well, if you are interested in further, or anybody is interested in further, um, research. Mary Beth Norton, the president of the American Historical Association, actually posted an article on their website back in May, I think it was. It's, I mean, the the impetus for posting the article is the current political use of the term witch hunt and what's really behind the term witch hunt. The full title is An Embarrassment of Witches. What's the history behind Trump's tweets? I was trying not to get political, mm. but might as well just throw it out there. <laughs> So in this article, Norton actually provides some conversations about witch hunts and um, what's behind a witch hunt, focusing specifically on Salem and Tichuba, and then includes some um, pretty important and current discussions of witchcraft and the witch hunts and uh, and Salem specifically. So uh, that's actually a pretty interesting article to read and a good jumping off point if you want to understand the um, – what happened in Salem in the American witch trials a bit more. Yeah, that's great. I'll definitely have to check out that article. Also, it just uh, popped into my head a similarity between some of the European trials and the American trials is sort of the nature of the accusations is that they were very similar. And I, I do recall reading one transcript of a case where a man was giving testimony against his wife. And one of the things he said is that you know, she kneeled down to pray and I couldn't hear what she was saying. And I always thought that was so interesting that because he was not aware of what she was actually saying, because perhaps she was having her own connection to this, you know, spiritual time of praying that it was like out of his control and therefore something negative, something harmful might be going on in that moment. Um, and I think that we see that kind of fear both within the American witch trials and the European witch trials. That's basically the, um, the Ann Hutchinson situation mm -hmm. right there is <laughs> that she was, yeah, she was leading religious ceremonies when, you know, women shouldn't be doing that kind of thing because God right. only knows what they'll get up to those crazy women. <laughs>
Great. Well, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation and actually, uh, I think, provides some great jumping off points for additional research and projects as well. So um, it's really what you're doing and the information that you're collecting is really important to not only your project, but to future history projects as well. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Oh, and one final thing is for anybody listening, if you live in New York State or anywhere near Ithaca, uh, Cornell has an amazing collection of uh, witchcraft documents, and it's currently on display, and it's just open. It's free to the public, so if you have a chance to visit it, you can learn a lot more about the European witch trials there. Great. Thank you. And as a former resident of upstate New York, you would also get a chance to visit a very beautiful area of the country. So, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) James Fennessy's family's house. Exactly. (laughs) We'll we'll put you up. We'll give you um, a tour of, you know, famous witch areas. Um, We'll make you some moonshine and it'll be a great time. So. (laughs) Excellent. Well, thank you, Maya. Thank you, Rob. Um, This was fantastic. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was a lot of fun.